All right, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today for Inside Higher Education's discussion with the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine. Today, we will be discussing how to apply a new medical school model to teaching empathy and communication. I'm your host, Prescott Stokes III, the Integrated Content and Marketing Manager here at the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine. And our first panelist is Dr. Stuart Flynn. He is the founding dean of the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine in Fort Worth, Texas. How you doing, Dean Flynn? Oh, thank you, Prescott, and welcome, everybody. All right, so let me tell everyone a little bit about Dean Flynn. So the school was accredited in October, 2018 and now has matriculated two classes of 60 students each. Dean Flynn has led the development of the new school and built a team that is creating an innovative and patient-centric curriculum that will change how doctors are being trained. This is being done in a supportive environment where students will become empathetic scholars who are training to be excellent communicators, active listeners, lifelong learners, and become valued physicians, colleagues, leaders, and citizens in their communities. Previously, Dean, Fitt, Dean Flynn served as the founding dean of the University of Arizona School of Medicine in Phoenix, Arizona. He was also a professor of pathology and surgery at Yale University School of Medicine for 20 years. While at Yale, he was an accomplished researcher, director of the residency program, a leader in the design and oversight of the school's curriculum, and founding inductee of the Society of Distinguished Teachers at Yale. Dean Flynn received his medical degree and residency training from the University of Michigan and completed a fellowship in oncologic pathology at Stanford University. Now, our next panelist is Dr. Yvonne Kaplan Liss, a visiting professor here at the Fort Worth MD School. And she is also the director of University of California, San Diego Center for Compassionate Communication and the Sanford Institute for Empathy and Compassion. How are you doing, Dr. Kaplan Liss? I'm great, Prescott. Really glad to be here. All right, we're happy to have you. So let me tell everyone a little bit about Dr. Captain Liss. She was previously the Assistant Dean of Narrative Reflection and Patient Communication at the Fort Worth Medical School when it opened in 2019. She led a talented interdisciplinary team that created our communication curriculum, which is called the Compassionate Practice. She was also the first Dean level position in a medical school dedicated solely to training faculty and medical students to communicate more effectively first and foremost with their patients, as well as with colleagues of other disciplines, the community, the media, funders, and policymakers. Now, currently, Chase Crossnow and Lauren Mitchell lead the compassionate practice, while Dr. Kaplan List serves as a visiting professor. And prior to arriving at the Fort Worth Medical School, Dr. Kaplan List worked at the nationally acclaimed Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science, where she was the founding medical program director. All right, and our third panelist is Alana Zago, a first year medical student here at the Fort Worth Medical School. How you doing, Alana? I'm doing well, thank you, Prescott. It's so good to be here with everyone. All right, we're happy to have you, Alana. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Alana. She grew up in Southern California and graduated from UC Santa Barbara with a Bachelor of Science and Biological Sciences in 2018. Throughout her undergraduate education, she explored her passion for the impact of nutrition and lifestyle behaviors on overall well being by receiving a health and wellness certificate through the Exercise and Sports Studies program. She also worked as a health educator in a medically supervised weight management program, which solidified her desire to want to pursue medicine. Alana aspires to continue advancing her knowledge, exploring lifestyle medicine and delving into the longitudinal integrated clerkship here at the Fort Worth Medical School in the coming years. Now, we will be taking questions from everyone watching later in our show. Feel free to submit those questions in the Q&A box as we begin our discussion. But first, let's just begin our, our discussion, Dr. Kaplan List, and let's just talk a little bit about are more higher education institutions making an effort to implement empathy training? Yeah, I'm happy to say yes. And it's been an evolution. When uh, I joined uh, 
TCU and UNTHSE School of Medicine, um, one of the main reasons I came was because of the focus of training empathetic scholars to, to communicate with empathy and compassion. And Dean Flynn made that a, a pillar of this medical school. And that was unique at the time, and it still is. Uh, but since then, there's been a lot of new programs opening up, a lot of, uh, a lot of higher ed in all fields, not just medicine, focusing on empathy and compassion. And um, a lot of that has to do with, there's always been fits and starts of programs and uh, being done in multiple institutions and now it's becoming more of a movement and um and we can we know but from what's happening in our world the importance of empathy and compassion and, and listening um and also there are, are new structures being uh, available to support these initiatives one um i sit on this committee at the double amc with amazing colleagues in arts and humanities and um a white paper was published from from our meetings uh about the fundamental role of arts and humanities in medical education and that sets the stage for the importance of it but more importantly, it uh, it sets the stage for evaluation and research in this field, which is so important. This is a brand new field. And I think the time is now for us to evaluate this curriculum. It also provides uh, resources and grants and faculty development to enable this to happen at other institutions. Um, also, the New York Times just printed a great article about arts and humanities in medical education and how students are, are seeking this out. Um, and, and this is not new. You know, they were like Rita Sharon from Columbia started the narrative medicine program. Um, and, and that taught us to listen to story and empathize with our patients. And, and we build upon those successes now uh, across all, ed all education, not just medical. Um, and I'm happy to see it's all continuing at TCU in my new role as the Director of Compassionate Communication, uh, Center for Compassionate Communication at UCSD. Uh, a, a very generous donor donated $100 million because he understood the importance of empathy and compassion in medical education and healthcare. Uh, and Chase and, and Dr. Lauren Mitchell are, are building, continuing to building the, the curriculum at TCU. All right, and that's great information, Dr. Kaplan Liss. Um, what we're gonna do now, we're gonna go back to that, that visual story of you and Dean Flynn sharing why empathy was one of the important pillars that the School of Medicine was built upon. And we'll go to that right now. It is part of the TCU's Lead On campaign. I'm passionate about how doctors communicate with their patients. I know how it impacted my life. I know this medical school is uniquely positioned that I can make a difference. My name is Yvonne Kaplan Liss. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Narrative Reflection and Patient Communication at the New School of Medicine. When I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with uh, ulcerative colitis, which is an uh, inflammatory disease that has ulcers and inflammation in your large intestine, and my intestine almost exploded, basically, perforated. We shopped around for a surgeon. I only had 24 hours, and my knight in shining armor walked in the room and said to my parents and myself, we're going to give your daughter the state-of-the-art operation. That one term, state-of-the-art, changed the trajectory of my entire life. What state-of-the-art meant to my parents and I was, this is the best, the greatest, we're in the best hands, one surgery will be done. What it meant from the medical side was, this is the newest that we're doing now. I ended up being one of the first kids and that learning curve. Well, now I'm spending my life basically trying to avoid things like the use of jargon and making sure the patient really understands what that means and that the doctor and the patient are on the same page when they're making a crucial decision like this. I was invited here to TCU. Alan and I came to meet Dean Flynn. One of his dreams for this medical school was communications, that it should be one of the pillars, not a second thought. 
You talk to patients and the number one thing that they will tell you they want is someone to sit down, look them in the eye, listen, and touch them. And that was what Yvonne, as soon as I met her. Hence, we brought Yvonne to help us design that in our curriculum. First and foremost, they're gonna be trained to be empathetic in everything that they do, in every encounter that they have. What does empathy have to do with communication? Everything. It's making the patient understand that they matter and that they're being heard, and it's all based in listening. A patient wants to be heard. It's very hard for established medical schools to break out from what they've done for decades to centuries. So we're the first medical school to anoint a communication individual as a dean. That was to tell our students, our community, and our future patients, this is so important to train the next generation. I'm excited to be here because this new medical school is uniquely positioned to take the lead on training the first generation of empathetic scholars. All right, so that was a beautiful video about Dr. Captain List that is part of TCU's Lead On campaign. And right now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna insert a poll question for everyone watching to take. And that question is, how long does it take on average for a physician to interrupt you when you are explaining why you are there? The choices you have are two seconds, 18 seconds, 64 seconds, in 91 seconds. Now, while everyone takes that poll, I am going to go to one of our students, Ilana. So Ilana, as a prospective student, what attracted you to this medical school in Fort Worth? Thank you, Prescott. I was definitely attracted to the medical curriculum uh, that actually has the communication training embedded in it. Uh, working as a health educator before medical school, I found that it was those soft elements of medicine, that effective communication, the empathy, that really had a positive impact on our patients' outcomes. Because without them feeling like I was truly invested in their health and in their goals, uh, my coaching meant nothing. And so that investment was really necessary for them to open up to me and to share their challenges. And for us to build a plan together that they could actually follow through with. And they couldn't succeed unless that trust was built. And I really believe that compassion provided the foundation for that trust. So when it came time for me to actually look at medical schools to apply to, it was really clear uh, that this school, TCU and UNTHSC School of Medicine, was the place I belonged. Uh, they really stood out among the rest as emphasizing those soft skills uh, and also believing in the power that they had. And that was really refreshing to see. So I was very confident that their education specifically would give me all of those skills necessary to be the absolute best physician I could be uh, and be there for my future patients. And uh, one of the most incredible things so far for me has been actually seeing this come to fruition. Um, I got chills watching that video because the school really does live its mission and it's really, really amazing to see that we're putting those messages uh, into practice. Yeah, thank you for that, Alana, just sharing your, your perspective and watching that video gave me chills as well because it directly relates to our poll question, which is how long does it take for a physician to interrupt you? The choices were two seconds, 18 seconds, 64 seconds, and in 91 seconds. So Dr. Kaplan List, when you shared your story in that video and, and you think about, you know, having a physician listen to you and, and not interrupt you and give you the correct information, can you tell us what the answer is to our poll question? And also why is this important to know for patients? Well, the answer is uh, 18 seconds and 60% uh, hit the nail on the head. So what I'm, what that says to me is that patients are uh, 
on this webinar, patients are experiencing this and uh, are experiencing the lack of time and compassion in, in, in their visits with uh, physicians and healthcare providers. And so now that we, we kind of have that set, so why is it important to teach empathy since it seems like it's something that clearly our audience understands and, and that we're trying to kind of help change that dynamic? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I started this journey along with my colleague uh, that I've been working with for more than 12 years. We started at the Alda Center, um, Val Lance Geffro. She's theater and a, and a master teach, a theater practitioner, a master teacher, and, and helped create uh, uh, this curriculum because we saw um, at the Alda Center there was a need for this uh, because there was a lack of compassion in, in communication in the way healthcare providers communicated with their patients and their colleagues and all audiences. Um, and there's a disconnect between what phys phys physicians think and what patients think. If you ask from these numbers, um, this is from a book called Compassionomics by Dr. Stephen Treziak and Anthony Mazzarelli. And I, uh, it's called Compassionomics and I um, highly recommend reading this book. It actually um, put data behind what Val and I saw um, we were facing in terms of training healthcare providers to, to actually put numbers to the crisis, the compassion crisis that's happening in this country. And as you can see from these numbers, if you ask physicians, um, a majority of them will say that they are compassionate. Uh, and But if you ask patients, uh, a majority of them say that they've experienced uh, a, a, a meaningful lack of compassion in, in their healthcare visits. Uh, and that's, that's telling. And physicians go into medicine because they are empathetic. That's most of the reasons why we want to go into medicine is to connect and, and connect with our patients. Uh, but empathy is different than compassion. And um, compassion is empathy plus action. And a patient has to feel that empathy um, so they can feel that they've had a compassionate visit. And you know, that brings me to Dean Flynn. When, when we have this conversation and we think about empathy, why as a leader of a medical education institution, why was it important to make empathy training a core foundation of a medical school? Because that's, that's different. Well, I think, um, so thank you, Prescott. I, I loved hearing what Alana had to say as a first year medical student. And we're sitting in the midst of a, of a, of a nationally renowned individual and, and Dr. Kaplan Liss. So why then bring this into medical school? And, and I came here because of this opportunity to start a brand new school, not inherit, as was said by, by Dr. Kaplan Liss earlier, um, decades to centuries of somebody else's curriculum. I think that when we have trained physicians over the decades, we teach them how to diagnose and we teach them how to treat. But what was always kind of assumed in that is we knew how to communicate and we were empathetic. And, and that assumption ultimately gets twisted. And, and, and yet, as, as Dr. Kaplan List said, if you talk with patients, they, they want you to communicate with them. They do want you to feel their emotions to the best of your ability. And, and they do want compassion. And so long story short, if we assume that's going to happen for a student like Alana, it, it may well happen. For a lot of medical students, it won't happen. So you have to make this very deliberate because at the end of the day, our patients are why we become physicians. And when they tell us we don't communicate well, we, we, we don't demonstrate our compassion well, we need to do something about that. Um, they're not as concerned about how well are, are, you know the basic sciences. They assume you know those things. So this is an amazing opportunity for a brand new medical school. So Dean Flynn, and especially for our audience that's watching, so now that you have that idea, how did you go about actually building that into the culture of the medical school? Well, I certainly think it's it's an ongoing project to be very, very clear. So I, th I think, first of all, you, you have to be deliberate. Um, so when Alana went through the interview process here, that was very deliberate. We talked about this. She may well have done an activity that illustrated 
which then shows we're serious about it. Um, we have to challenge ourselves, um, the individuals in the medical school. They, they, they have to challenge this concept. It's very easy to slide away from this. I think I may have he heard Alana use the term uh, uh, soft curriculum, but if she didn't, that is out there. Soft curriculum means to a medical student, if it's soft, it's not going to be on my exam. It's, it's the other things. And, and so medical students are amazingly efficient with how they use their time because they need to pass exams to become a physician. So, so we need to give feedback. We need to get feedback and we need to give it to students, to faculty. Um, we need to explore from our heart and not just our head. This is not all just intellectual. We have to allow ourselves to be people in this process. Um, and, and, and examine your biases. I think that's another big deal. So you can see these have a certain subjectivity to them, but you have to be very deliberate in revisiting and revisiting and revisiting. And by the end of four years, I'm fully um, anticipating and hopeful that Alana will be, and I'm, I'm no pressure Alana, will be this amazing, empathetic scholar, compassionate physician that her physicians will love to have her as their physician. Not because she's the smartest person in the town, she's very smart, but because she can be empathetic and compassionate. And, and Dean Flynn, medical students typically come into medical school with a very high level of empathy. They want to care for people, they want to help people. How do we maintain that? So that, that, that is a great observation. It is a true observation. It's been very nicely studied that medical students, applicants, I should say, have empathy significantly above their peers who are also in college going into other, other disciplines. That's, the, that's part of the calling to becoming a, a physician. <clears throat> we, we can very easily have that loss in, in medical school if you're not very deliberate about maintaining it. And the way that, that I believe it's been very nicely shown to maintain it is have these young physicians to be in training, take care of patients, but patients they see again and again. And now they start to relate, whether it's the patient who's pregnant, whether it's it's uh, the equivalent of Dr. Kaplan lists a teenager with ulcerative colitis or with, with diabetes. Um, that can't be a single hit. That has to be my patient that I might follow for four years. That's how you maintain a medical student's empathy. That's why they came to medical school to, to help, help um, care for others. We need to give them that opportunity and to see the return on investment with their patients. Now, Dr. Kaplan Liss, after hearing Dean Flynn explain how that following patients is built into the curriculum, so the medical students will follow a patient from the very beginning of their time until the very end. Uh, the next question is, how can you teach empathy um, from, from an educational standpoint? Yes. So, to, you know, empathy has two pieces. There's this cognitive piece, which is a deliberate skill that everyone can learn. And then there's this emotional empathy that can also be deliberate if you're trained to, um, to, to sharpen that skill. And um, in the curriculum that we all developed together called the Compassionate Practice, the goal of that curriculum is to understand who these patients are, their story, who they are, what's their goal, why does this matter to them? And the same for you as, as a uh, physician or healthcare provider, understand yourself. Uh, so you can then have an, an empathetic, compassionate connection with your patient. And that's not easy. You know, this curriculum we've developed is a, is a, is a, the goal of it is to give busy physicians and medical students a process that they can fall back on a quick process in order to make these connections in times that they're exhausted or that they're emotionally drained because oftentimes we're asked to give as healthcare providers what we don't have. And, uh, and this will help help in these times and also 
the resilience piece of, of medicine. There's a, a crisis also in healthcare of burnout. And, um, and there is a spectrum of empathy. So uh, like I said, a lot of medical students enter medical school because they are empathetic. Some are on one end of the spectrum where they feel this empathy and it drains them. And then there's the other end under the spectrum, which is less of that. And the goal um, we developed as a team was to, was to everything in moderation because we don't want our students to burn out and we also want our students to be compassionate and empathetic and this is what that training um, provides and it takes practice practice with longitudinal patients is what makes it uh, being be able to practice it. And Ilana so are you and your classmates embracing this empathy training and do you see the effects of the compassionate practice training on you and your studies, but also in your day-to-day -day life? Yes, definitely. I truly see my classmates embracing this every single day. Uh, for example, in some of our clinical skills sessions, we're actually paired as small groups with a standardized patient. And I can see how my classmates are using a lot of open-ended questions, uh, but also silence. Uh, to really give that patient their space and allow them to tell their story. And so they're really fostering that atmosphere where the patient does feel welcome to express themselves. And I see by, by us doing that, we actually elicit really key pieces of information from their medical history that we might have missed out on if we weren't giving them the space to do so, which is really neat. And because we began our longitudinal integrated clerkship uh, in year one, we're actually uh, able to model that training. So it's neat to see that I can actually put into practice what we're learning uh, with real patients. And like Dean Flynn and Dr. Kaplanis mentioned, patients that we actually follow long-term and can build those connections with, uh, which is amazing. And I do feel very confident that my classmates do the same because I do read their narrative reflections where we kind of talk about our experiences in that program so far, and they are very vulnerable and insightful. And it's, it's clear to see how seriously they're taking this training. Uh, and I, just to add, I, I don't just see this training in our clinical experiences. Um, this might be a little bit more unconventional, but I do actually see this training reflected in how our class treats each other. Um, this year has, has not been without its challenges, um, just like the, the devastating snowstorm that we had that hit Texas. Um, and every single individual in our class reached out to each other and extended such compassion and empathy. And so I just see it modeled in, like you said, our, our day-to-day -day life, and that's in our learning environments as well. There's just such a sense of collaboration and community that I feel so comfortable to share even gaps in my knowledge. And I, I do think that a lot of that comes from this training that's that's embedded in our curriculum. And you know, Dr. Kaplan, this like hearing Ilana explain that, and a lot of these communication skills sound really transferable, right, across disciplines. So um, for yourself, for Val Lance Geffro, for Chase Crossno, Dr. Lauren Mitchell, what are some of the, the exercises that the medical students go through um, to improve th those kind of communication skills? Um, first, I just want to thank Alana for um, articulating the experience um, that that she's having and and also showing how it's um, it's not like add water and stir right it's it, the goal is to have an authentic experience and and, and her mentioning um, the silence right is 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 is, 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 is can in moments be compassionate so these are things that Alana, Alana seems to be practicing and and um, thank you for sharing that uh, so the curriculum uh, it has a lot to do with being aware and connecting. Listening is the is the foundational piece of the curriculum, and it's not what you think of listening, but just listening to the words. It's active listening, um, and you want to be careful of the words that you choose. You want to be able to talk in a language that your patient or another colleague can understand, 
and um, and always establishing common ground is a, is a really great way of connecting with your patient. The what what really makes the compassionate practice exciting for me is that we practice something called the Medici effect, which is uh, it's another great book I I suggest, which is where different disciplines come together to innovate, and um, our team is that. Uh, Val Lance Geffro, an actor, Chase Crosno, an actor in public health background, Lauren Mitchell, uh, the narrative medicine and reflections that, that, um, that Alana mentioned, and uh, my background in journalism and medicine, is what links this um, this curriculum together, and then has experiences like Alana shared. So they write narrative reflections on their experiences uh, in clinical skills and also with their real patients. Uh, we incorporate improvisational, which is theater theater games, to to learn authenticity and connection. Um, we do a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion and implicit bias in understanding how we working with the diversity um, team at TCU to understand uh, where you are coming from so you can in, you know, encounter these, um, these communication with your patients with authenticity and understand um, where that patient is as well. Uh, and, and that's just a few of the exercises, but it's adapted also outside of medicine because these are just foundational communication skills that we've uh, layered on with arts and humanities. And Dr. Kaplan, list when you think about some of these exercises, you explain that that um, involve theater. It sounds like it would be something that you kind of need to be in person to do, given that we're in a pandemic. When you think about institutions maybe doing some things in person, some things in a hybrid model, how can you teach some of these same basic empathy exercises uh, using technology like Zoom? Yeah, well, like like um, Dean Flynn said, it's been a work in progress. You know, there's been pros and cons to Zoom, a lot more uh, pros than I ever expected to have. Uh, you know, some of these in-person exercises we cannot do, but what it enabled us to do was to be in the room with our medical students during their encounters with their SPs uh, that we couldn't be doing before. So we were able to see how they were applying their skills in real time and give immediate feedback, which is very unique in medical education to have that much uh, faculty to student ratio. They have cohort faculty that also give them this feedback. And Zoom allowed us to be able to, to do that, which was um, which I think was, uh, as, a, as a former medical student, I would have wished I had that immediate feedback. I I Ilana, can you just kind of talk to us about your experience since you're a first year medical student, a lot of your medical school experience so far has been using uh, modalities like Zoom. So how, how has it been learning these kind of communication exercises? Yeah, just to, to echo what Dr. Kaplan List said, um, we, I think we can absolutely practice these, you know, active listening uh, strategies, allowing us to connect with individuals via Zoom. And we've done a lot of amazing exercises in this first year already. And just to give like, a concrete example, one, one of my favorite exercises that we do is actually reflect on pieces of creative writing uh, and even art. And through this close reading and facilitated discussions that we have in small breakout rooms, which is great uh, for people to feel comfortable uh, to express themselves, uh, we are really able to benefit. And I think uh, Dean Flynn mentioned you know, biases. Um, another example is we can actually use these modalities to uncover our own personal biases, which I think is just super important uh, before we do become physicians uh, in order to confront those and then evolve. Um, and as someone who I love creative writing, I really do enjoy those close reading sessions. So it's been it's been incredible. Uh, and we read a lot of very interesting, uh, thought provoking pieces of work. Now, now, Dean Flynn, I want to bring you back into this conversation right now, because, you know, some physicians and students may see what Dr. Captain List and Ilana explaining as soft skills and and wonder if our medical students will actually be good doctors referring to the science of medicine. So is, is this something you get asked often? And if, if so, how do you respond to, to critics in that way? Yeah, thank you, Prescott. So, so the answer is yes, I get asked it often. 
Um, if you're going to start a new medical school, you better have a lot of calluses on your hands and you better have very thick skin or you better design the same medical school that every physician in the past is trained at, which means you're mired in the past rather than looking into the future. So without a question, we get asked this. What, what is frustrating to me is our medical students get asked this and they get asked it in a way which really is reflecting on, you're not training how I trained and I'm a very good physician. So ergo, how are you going to be a very good physician? I find that a heavy handed, mean spirited question to ask a medical student, just to be very, very clear about this. Bottom line is, as I joke with my children, back in the days of the giants, which is when I went to medical school and trained, you were on call every other night. You didn't sleep, you ran around, you never had a chance to really slow down and get to know your patients very well. But that's not, we're not training our physician, our medical students to have other physicians think that they're great physicians. We're training our medical students so their patients think they're great physicians. That's a very different barometer. I get asked it a lot as, as physicians listen, the number of times that I hear, wow, I wish that had been in my curriculum. But I'll, I'll close with the following comment. And I think this gets lost on people. People think this is a zero sum game. You can either be really good in the sciences or you can be good in communication. That is absolutely not true. You can be fantastic in both of them. But if you're not good in both of them, you're not gonna be a very good physician. Um, so I, I, the, the premise of the question is, if you're learning how to communicate and be empathetic, something must be missing from, from your um, repertoire and from your training. It's not true. And it's very clear. And I can guarantee you, if, if I asked Alana, how much basic and clinical science is she asked to learn in addition to understanding communication and narrative writing, um, I'm pretty comfortable telling you, she's gonna tell you she's real busy. <laughs> so Ilana, with that said, let's, let's go to you. And so how has it been a surprise to you that along with a lot of that clinical training that you're getting, um, that so much of your medical school training is involving communication? I, I have to say I'm I'm not surprised, but I think that that does have to do a lot with my experiences prior to beginning medical school. Um, I did attend an art school for both creative writing and acting. So coming in, I did see tremendous value in using these teaching modalities like theater, the narrative reflection uh, to guide both that self-examination, but also connection with others. Um, but on a more personal note, I've witnessed family members walking out of doctor's offices feeling even more helpless and confused than they did when they walked in there uh, because the physician was speaking in a language that they didn't understand. And I've personally felt unheard by physicians um, just because that effective communication was lacking and the compassion wasn't there. And then I've seen the downstream effect of that is individuals being less likely to seek care, which is then going to ne negatively impact their health. So it really makes sense to me that if we're learning how to skillfully communicate with our future patients to really speak to them on their level, we're going to be improving their health. Um, and for example, a lesson that I've been learning, uh, still learning uh, throughout this, this training is to always consider the patients where where are they coming from? What are their feelings? What is their experience? And that's tremendously helped me connect to patients in the clinic even now. I mean, I, I can recall an experience where an individual felt comfortable opening up to me and sharing personal things with me as a medical student, which is so humbling. And it was just an incredible experience. So it's things like that. It's moments like that with the patients that really solidify like Dean Flynn was mentioning that you, you can have all the science knowledge in the world, but if you don't have this missing piece, these soft skills, that the patient's not going to trust you, it's not going to be, um, your advice, your, your plan is not going to be effective. So I do think you need both. I think both the communication, the compassion, the science, it's, it's all essential uh, to medical training. And 
you know, I just want to say when you when Alana just mentioned a, a few seconds ago, the, the the where is the patient coming from? That is something that the faculty and staff at the Fort Worth Medical School has also learned as well. I've sat through those training sessions as well with Dr. Kaplan List and her team. So Dean Flynn, when you think about how this unique approach and this communications training um, is changing things, how have physicians in the community viewed this? Um, and also has it benefited their own practices now that the students are partnered with them? Yeah, thanks um, Prescott. So, <clears throat> First of all, to echo a little bit um, of what you just said of, of, of everybody at the medical school going through these exercises, not all just medical students. Uh, I, I hope, I know, I know not everybody in the audience is from the healthcare sector. These are, these are transportable. Um, first of all, they're skill sets that we all need to have regardless of our job, but it's also transportable. These are not unique to, to medical schools whatsoever. I will tell you, I love listening to Alana. Um, so we're in a phenomenal community, Fort Worth, Texas. Our healthcare systems have just thrown their arms around us and embraced us. They've welcomed our medical students into the community. Um, and then it's a little bit, they're from Missouri. Uh, just show me, let me see if this is real. That's not, that's not how any of our doctors were trained. Let's see what this is all about. And I will just say very succinctly that the comments I hear coming back really just, you couldn't ask for more, for, for, for nicer things to hear. And, and, and what I hear are, are two things. Wow, your students are, are very smart, my word, not theirs, in, in the sciences of medicine. Okay, well, that would have been the, the moniker for my success in my era. And quite frankly, for every era up to today, if I'm really smart in understanding different things about diabetes, I'm a really good medical student, but maybe not so much so. But then the number of physicians who have had one of our students who say, and can they do a nice job communicating with our patients? And then you kind of wait, and then you hear, and our patients just love being with your medical students. That's a home run. So um, do we have growth? Yes. Do we have some issues we need to address? Absolutely. Um, but I, I, I think the, the elixir we came here to set up um, is, is the correct one. Now we just have to really optimize it. Um, so getting nice feedback is the bottom line. Nice. And, and Dr. Kaplan Liss, I just want you to just let everyone know, you know, we watched the video about your story, but can you just explain to us again why you have devoted your career to teaching compassionate communication? And also, how do you see this empathy training working in other fields outside of medicine? Sure. Um, so you heard in that video that I was a chronic patient starting at the age of 15. So I understand what it is to be a patient and, and on the receiving end of um, compassionate communication and not so compassionate communication, as well as now I'm a physician. So I understand both sides of, of the issue and I, and I um, empathize with what physicians are going through in, in, in especially with what happened with COVID and, and, the, and the constraints and, and the stress. Um, and I just always knew that um, I could make some sort of difference or I always wanted to make some sort of difference with um, learning to be a journalist and the communication skills I learned. I always say that was the best training I ever got to be a physician. Uh, so I've dedicated my career just to chip away at this. This is, you know, this is a big undertaking and there's a lot of great faculty and educators doing um, similar uh, curriculum. And it's time we all come together to, um, to work together to have data to support what we do and to spread it further. Um, and, that's not, and that's also out of medical education. So we've gotten requests from architecture firms to help them design empathetic clinics. Uh, so this, this isn't just applied to medicine. This applies to every field. It applies to working in teams, no matter what field you're in, understanding your colleagues. Uh, there's a lot of office um, stress and arguments. And uh, this type of curriculum can help bridge those gaps. 
And so now we're gonna open it up for Q&A. We have quite a few questions um, from everyone in the audience. And so I'm just gonna get right to it. So our first question is, is from a school educator. And the question is, what would you say to teachers and administrators in schools regarding empathy? Um, Dr. Kaplan, Liss, I'll, I'll let you begin with that. If, if there was just a message for teachers and administrators in, in institutions. Uh, so these are established institutions. We were lucky at TCU to start from scratch. And that's a different story. So I, you know, I believe in baby steps and, um, and having the goal of starting to include empathy and compassion in, in, little, in little steps in what you do, how you communicate with your students, model this behavior. So uh, development of your faculty is key. Uh, these are little things that you can do to bring everybody on the same page so you can move forward and make bigger change. And our next question, um, Dean Flynn, I'm gonna give this one to you. It says, do you have a continuum of education slash learning for, uh, for the content for the first year, second year, third year that evolves and becomes more in depth over the years for groups? Yes, we, we do in, in every field in, in um, medical education and definitely in, in this curriculum which Alana will now watch play out. So we will have more expectations. The competencies that we will expect from our students will go up. It's the normal part of their growth. They should get better. And we need to measure with, with objective or semi-objective competencies, are they getting better? So yes, that's all very mapped out. It's not whimsical. It's not just, oh, I think Alana's doing a good job. Good job, let's move on. Um, they, they, we put them through the gates, so to speak, but that's good for them. They need to know what they're expected to know. And uh, we have another question um, about counselor, uh, counselor. So Dean Flynn, what are your thoughts about incorporating counselor educators into the medical program faculty to take on developing these soft skills for medical students? It has to be done and taught somehow. I was very fortunate, our school very fortunate to attract Dr. Kaplanless and colleagues. But to be honest with you, if we had not done that, it's that kind of resource I would absolutely be looking for. Um, you can't ask me to teach this. This is not my area of expertise. So, so yes, I, I don't think this is uh, territorial. I think we need to make sure our students get the appropriate training. And if it comes from counselors outside of medicine, why would I be bothered by that? And uh, we have another question. Um, this, this is a pretty interesting um, question. Um, so the, the, the attendee in the audience uh, says their son trained in medical school and works uh, for the Bio Center for Alcohol the Bow Center for Alcohol Center there in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, they say it is important to understand that systems, healthcare, and public schools, et cetera, are interrelated. That is why what you are doing is so important and should be examined across systems. Dean Flynn, do you think that is something that should be examined across the board, whether it's a medical school or a different type of institution? You know, if I'm understanding the cor uh, question correctly, let me, let me just say what's happening in Fort Worth and I'll reiterate what a phenomenal city and partner this is. So we work very closely with the Fort Worth public school system for a variety of reasons. We work very closely with the community college system in, in, in Tarrant County. Um, and then of course, we work very closely with our healthcare systems. Once again, and I may not be answering the question, this is not um, a, a, a turf issue. This is about making our entire community better. It starts all the way from, from birth and, and, and pre-K programs, all the way up. We get the beauty of recruiting from UC Santa Barbara, a medical student like Alana, but, but there will be hundreds and hundreds to thousands of young people that this medical school will touch we don't touch them for the interest of going to medical school. If they want to, man, we're right here for them. 
but we want them to succeed and grow. And we can't do that by ourselves. So we have to do it with the public school system. And we do. Hey, Dr. Kaplan, listen, we have a question that I think would be really, really good for you to answer. So the question is, how would you reconcile a physician's desire to be empathetic and give patients time to express their symptoms, concerns, ask questions, et cetera, in the institutional demands for a quick turnover, like seeing patients every 30 minutes or less? Yeah. Uh, great question, and uh, and it's a reality. Uh, what we what we teach, though, are are quick ways that a patient can feel uh, that that was a compassionate visit. It doesn't necessarily have to take a long time. I think we saw in one of the slides if you let a patient finish telling their story, it doesn't usually go on for more than two minutes, uh, and then they feel heard. When you when you cut off a patient at 18 seconds, it starts the visit off uh, on the wrong foot. So little, little changes, active listening, just making them feel that you really are listening, being present, which is really hard for uh, busy physicians to do, but to start practicing that so they can be present takes no time at all. Uh, so these are these are just skills that we work on and, and develop, and it isn't easy. Nobody, you know, this, you'll never get there. It's a, it's a journey, it's not a destination, but we just hope to um, get better and better and learn um, how to connect and communicate with anybody we speak with. And, and Dean Flynn, we had another question came in. Um, so the question is, is actually just about, are you aware of, of other schools, other medical schools um, developing empathy in their curriculum, um, just from what you've been hearing? Right, so I, I'm, I'm scanning the questions because I, want, I feel badly Alana's sitting here and not, not getting asked any questions. <laughs> she probably isn't feel, feeling badly at all. Um, the, the answer is, and I think Dr. Kaplan-Liss will have even a more informed uh, uh, opinion on this. I think this is um, absolutely catching serious, serious momentum. And I think it should. And, and so, you know, now the question is, how much time can they devote to it? How much do they inculcate it into their culture? Or is it just something that every class, every year they get two hours of something? Um, but, uh, but Yvonne, why don't you chime in? But I do think we're understanding the critical importance of this. Yeah, I, I think um, I think medical education is understanding how important this is. And again, in an established institution without the right tools and resources, it's challenging to do. Uh, UCSD, where I'm at now, has the benefit of having this whole institute dedicated to empathy and compassion, the Sanford Institute. That's their mission to uh, research empathy and compassion, to change and transform medical education. Uh, and with those resources, is it's still challenging in established, you know, established schools. But again, I wouldn't, you know, baby steps in something like this. I wouldn't focus on this big, big uh, dream yet. You know, have your big dream, but take baby steps to get there. And it's so important to support faculty. One of the one of the barriers that we've seen is uh, faculty that have so many talents in these areas, but they're not supported financially or with time to um, to devote to something like this because of the constraints on medical education. And I think this double AMC is taking a big step with with a uh, with this recent white paper to. Um, to at least put it on the radar screen of, of medical schools and uh, also hospitals. It's not just, it's, it's through the, uh, the spectrum up to CME, continuing medical education, to make this a focus, to try and support it, to start researching it, faculty development to train faculty to do this and um, and also support uh, teams that work together. I've always worked with Val or Chase or Lauren in team teaching because uh, they, the, the, the student gets a perspective of the humanities as well as uh, my perspective is being in their shoes as a physician. And if, if institutions can support that, magic happens. So um, these are just you know ways that hopefully all together, we can work to spread this. And Ilana, there is a question um, for you. So your background, you already had communications in your background with art and things like that. So the question is, what about your peers? Were some of them skeptical if they didn't have the same type of uh, background that you had from undergrad? 
Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think most were not. I, I do think that a common theme among my classmates and something that attracted us to the school is this training because we do see how important communication is and compassion. Um, a few, you know, that, that might have been maybe a little bit more skeptical. I, I feel that as soon as we got into clinic, they quickly saw the value of this. And I can see that I, I know I mentioned the narrative reflections before, but reading about their personal experiences and seeing how these modalities were helping them actually already connect uh, to real patients in the clinic, uh, even communicating with our preceptors in, in a very tangible way um, that they see the value of this. And uh, just to add one last thing, I, I think it's these meaningful connections that do help when, when we're feeling maybe a little bit burnt out from studying or if we're getting a little bit frustrated with the material, we're seeing the, the power and we're seeing why it even matters, you know, why, why the work that we're putting in, what, it, what impact is it going to have? Um, and I think it's these skills that are helping us see that. So even if, even if they were as skeptical, I, I do think they're, they're not anymore. That's a great answer. And, and Dean Flynn, I have a great question for you. Uh, they said this philosophy of medical education is a breath of fresh air, but they want to know what has been the plan for bringing clinical preceptors outside of the medical school on board with these concepts or are the students themselves the ambassadors for this kind of training? No, it is a fantastic question and Dr. Kaplan Lewis knows this well. We're focused on our medical students first, but that's not where it ends. So, so we've already, the team has already done um, uh, clinical preceptor training, clinician training, basically, team training, um, uh, nurses. And, and so absolutely, this is not, this is something that, that our, and our students will be ambassadors, first of all. And the other thing I should just share in, in Fort Worth, we're growing graduate medical education. This is an opportunity for new programs there to, to immediately uh, embrace and deliver this curriculum because if you don't, we'll we'll revert right back to the way we've done things, and 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 then we're going to have uh, trainees who we could have maybe done better with with their empathetic and their compassion, um, and it's a missed opportunity. And we have another question for Dr. Captain Liss, and I think this goes back to faculty and staff training, Dr. Captain Liss. So the question is how to practice empathy while communicating with an authoritarian and or a dictator supervisor at work. I pose this question to you because as a, a staff member, we went through some of the communications trainings, but these were some of the scenarios that we had to learn how to navigate. Yeah. So I, I, if I'm hearing the question is right, how would you communicate with your uh, director uh, if they have an authoritative kind of ruling? Um, well, that's a challenge. And uh, but, you, you know, if you create uh, an understanding of or if you figure out an understanding of who this person is and what are their uh, goals and what's been happening to them, try to understand that. Uh, you may have a different perspective on, on your relationship or at least how to reach them and to start the conversation. Uh, we actually teach, um, teach this uh, exact scenario and, uh, and practice understanding both sides. You know, your side as the, as, as the employee that feels oppressed or, and then, then the, dictator, uh, the dictator boss. And, uh, and then we come to the conclusion that they really have the same goals in the end uh, and how to diffuse those situations. All right, and thank everyone for the questions. There were so many questions um, in the Q&A. We appreciate them. We hope you got a lot from this conversation. So thank you all for joining us from the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine for this discussion about teaching empathy and communication and how to apply a new medical school model to your work. I wanna thank our special guest, Dean Stuart Flynn, Dr. Yvonne Captain Liss, and Alana Zagel. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And if you need more information about the School of Medicine and also the Compassionate Practice, it's really easy. You can visit us at mdschool.tcu.edu. Thanks for joining us. You all have a wonderful afternoon.